Hello world! Uh, this is the beginning of JavaScript Air episode... What episode is this? 15. Um, we're base zero, so this is our 16th... Or not base zero, but index zero. Uh, our 15, or 16th episode. Um, we're going to be talking about Ava, Futuristic Test Runner. It's a uh, really sweet test runner that is um, in active development right now uh, for uh, test runner for JavaScript. It's awesome. I, I use it. I love it. And um, we have some of the core team members to chat about that today. So before I get into that too much, though, I um, just want to give a couple of announcements. First, um, a shout out to our amazing sponsors. Egghead.io is a, the show's premier sponsor, and they have a huge library of bite-sized web development training videos that is growing every day. Um, I have the privilege of being an instructor, and so I can see all the lessons that are upcoming, and let me tell you, they have some cool things in store. So uh, check them out for content on JavaScript, Angular, React, Node, and so much more. Then Frontend Masters is a recorded expert-led workshop with courses on advanced JavaScript, asynchronous, and functional JS, as well as lots of other great courses on front-end topics. And come August, I'm actually giving two workshops for front-end masters, one about Webpack and another about open source, and so I look forward to that. I'm looking forward to it anyway. And then for TrackJS, they report bugs in your JavaScript before customers notice them, and with their telemetry timeline, you'll have the context to actually fix them. Check them out and start tracking JavaScript errors today at trackjs.com. And uh, our next sponsor is WallabyJS. WallabyJS is an intelligent and super fast test runner for JavaScript that continuously runs your tests, kind of uh, relevant to our conversation today. It uh, reports code coverage and other results directly in your code editor immediately as you change your code. Check them out at wallbjs.com. And finally, Code Cove. Code Cove is code coverage done right. Reduce technical debt by visualizing test performance and faster code review. Code Cove is highly integrated with GitHub and provides browser extensions. Learn more at codecove.io. Yes, we love testing here at JavaScript Air, obviously. Last week's show was about testing, too. There's just this theme about testing that I don't know. Um, so, great. Um, n next announcement, just make sure that if you're watching the show live, that uh, you, uh, if you have any questions, go ahead and ask them with the hashtag JSAirQuestion on Twitter. And then, um, yeah, for our, our general announcements, um, our show next week is going to be about Vue.js or Vue.js. I'm not sure how to say that, but it's a framework. Um, and uh, our... Um, Evan Yu, the author of the framework, will be on there to join um, join us. And we're actually doing... I, I'm trying to get a bunch of different frameworks on the show right around the same time so we can just kind of explore the different uh, options and, and philosophies and methodologies of these different frameworks. And so Vue is our, our first one, and then we'll also have um, Angular the following week, and then we'll hopefully have Ember upcoming soon as well. So should be, uh, and React uh, will be coming up soon also, hopefully. So should be kind of fun. But today we are talking about Ava. So let me just introduce everybody. Unfortunately, I have no panelists join me today. So that is sad. Um, but hopefully we can still have a great conversation with the Ava team. So let me introduce them to you. James Talmadge. Say hi, James. Hello. How are you? <laughs> And uh, Mark Wubin. Yeah. And Vadim Demetis. Hey, Ron. All right, sweet. So um, let's go ahead and get an intro to each one of you before we get into our conversation about Ava. So why don't we start out with you, James? Uh, yeah. Um, I'm James. I uh, live in a suburb of Detroit, uh, Michigan. And uh, I run my own little construction company up here. And I write code in my spare time. and. Joined the Ava team back in, I want to say November of last year, November, December, something like that. And uh, it's uh, I was really right before it kind of took off and went crazy and started getting a lot of attention. It's been a fun ride. Very cool, awesome, Mark. Um, hey, um, I'm based in London, and I do lots of JavaScript. I'm wearing my my Laugh JavaScript T-shirt here, if you can if you can see it. Um, so I've been doing some open source projects the past couple of months after I left my sort of steady job to do some new challenges. And then I've been in the Ava team for about four weeks. So that's exciting to be here. Cool. Thank you. And uh, Vadim. So uh, hello, everyone, again. Um, so my name is Vadim. I'm from Ukraine. 
and I've been part of AVA team since September. And uh, just like every one of you, I'm a JavaScript and uh, can say an enthusiast, I'm an addict, especially to Node.js. And uh, I love posting GIFs with Leonardo DiCaprio on uh, our pool. <laughs> Fantastic. I feel like that's a very important role that you play in the AVA uh, community support, so that's yeah. good. It brings a lot of great culture. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> very good. Awesome. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and start talking about AVA. So um, before we get into um, the, the conversation that we've kind of outlined here in our, our Google Doc here, um, I think it would be valuable to talk first about what, um, what AVA is, what um, pains is it trying to solve? So whoever feels like they can take that. Oh man, I mean there's a there's a bunch of different things. I mean I think one of the first goals we approached was uh, being fast through con concurrency um, and we achieved concurrency in a couple of ways. First of all every test file you have is split into its own process so you have multiple processes running at once and then within each file, um, unless you mark the test as otherwise, um, each test gets launched at, one, launched at once. So if you have asynchronous tests that are doing any type of I.O. or have a timeout or anything like that, um, those are all running concurrently at once. And so I think that was one of the initial goals of it was to make it fast. And then Babel support got added and, and a number of other things. I mean, maybe somebody else wants to talk about Babel. Because um, I think it's a pretty key, the Babel integration is a pretty key uh, feature of what we do. Yeah, indeed. I, I can also add that one of the goals, uh, one of the also initial goals uh, for Ava framework was to actually be more like a friend to a developer. Because it feels like, I've seen a lot of tweets and people saying that uh, Ava feels like an intelligent software and just it, it's really... I'm, 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 and all of the team members feel really good about that, and we also weigh all decisions to actually not just throw an error and the uh, error stack and just let the developer figure out what's hap what happened, but more like what to do next, why it happened. Like we, we try to be as helpful as possible in in each area. I think that that's primarily accomplished through the power assert module. Can you talk about that for a second? Oh yeah, power assert. That's I think uh, one of our killer features, which uh, I don't think no no one else in uh, test frameworks has. So yeah, <laughs> I don't know, James. It's, maybe you, you almost kind of have to go on on to either the power asserts into the power asserts of documentation or our documentation and see a layout. Um, have someone maybe wants to do a screen share of. Of, of what the power assert printout looks like. Basically it uh, takes if you had a um, if you had an object and you're accessing two or three members deep it, it creates a really interesting view uh, when you have a failed assertion of the different members it kind of lays them out in a graph so you can kind of see what uh, where your assertion went wrong easily right in the terminal. And it's you kind of have to see it to to understand why it's cool. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think that like so in other testing and assertion uh, libraries that I've used, they allow you to provide a message with the assertion. Um, and Ava does this as well. Um, and I used to like I was really close to the point of saying, okay, I'm going to lint that you always have a message in here because you know seeing a failure that says like one does not equal two is not very helpful to me. Um, and so it's a lot easier to see somebody say, like, the length of items in the list should have been, you know, two or something like that. Um, but with with Ava using this power assert module for all of your assertions, when you say, like, t dot true, you know, this triple equals this or whatever, um, the Ava power assert like error output will actually say like this is what the values were at the time like the actual object itself. Right. Um, so it will say like um, if you're like doing a social um, thing, it would say friends dot length equals three. Right. Like if you add added three friends and then expected 
the length to, of the friends array to be three, you would see in the terminal friends.length equals three without having to type any of that. Um, exactly, yeah. In, in the linter that we're building, we actually have a um, prefer power assert rule where uh, if you enable that, you actually throw out the whole assertion, Ava assertion API, and just use t.ok and um, entirely use power assert to get truthy values back, right? So that you can just say, uh, you, you, you're no longer memorizing an API, and that's actually like, I want to say one of the taglines of power assert is like, stop memorizing an assertion API. Just create expressions that return a truthy value or not, and they'll show it to you right on the screen as part of your failure message without you having to type in a message at all. It's kind of pretty amazing. Yeah, we have to give huge, huge credit to PowerSelt Creator because it really bring, brings a lot of value to Ava. Very cool. Yeah, I, I don't want to get too far down that hole. There are more things to talk about um, there, but um, let, let's talk more about uh, some of the other benefits of Ava over some you know other testing frameworks that people might be familiar with. Well, I think Babel is a really big one. Uh, we talked about it briefly before. Um, we have built in Babel translation for your test files right now, not your sources, but that's coming. Um, and one of the big things that it gives you is the ability to use async await uh, functions, which is a, if you're not familiar, um, you use promises and return those from functions, and you can actually just use an await statement. Instead of a callback, you get the result or rejection of the promise is, is either behaves like a, a if it, the promise rejects, it behaves like a thrown error just in synchronous code. And with uh, Ava's uh, async nature, running everything concurrently, that it, it can create some really compact tests. I'd recommend um, going to the Ava documentation and, and hunting down the async await examples in the documentation to see how it takes what can be um, a little bit of callback hell, as they call it, and really flattens it all out and makes it really easy to read and understand. Yeah, and we have a super cool watch mode thanks to Mark. Mark, what do you say about it? <laughs> um, I think as we try and build these features, it's easy to follow what a different test runner did before. But because we're building something new um, with newer JavaScript features that are not even standardized yet, we have a chance to rethink some of those things. Um, so for instance, in the watcher, OK, you can rerun all the tests when you change a file, but you can start making that smarter. So if you change a test file, we'll only rerun that test file. If you change the source file, we'll run all the test files. Um, but we can then also track the dependencies of your test, so which source that it required from, from disk. Then if we detect a change to that source file, we know exactly which test file we have to rerun. So then you can just leave it open in the window and develop away, and the test will rerun whenever you make a change. And it will only do those that it actually has to retest. Yeah, I recently started using this feature because I, I finally was able to upgrade to the latest version of Ava. Um, hooray, thank you. And um, I, it's amazing. I have, um, you know, we're working on adding more tests to our application. So we've got about 120 tests. And so, it, you know, starting it out, it ran all of those tests. And then I went and updated a utilities file that's used by several other uh, units in the, in the code. And it reran 30 tests. And it's like, whoa, that is, that, to me, that was super cool because as our test suite grows, it's going to take a little bit longer. Um, and so it's, it's really nice to get much faster feedback, um, you know, and, and just see this stuff that's relevant to the things that I changed. Uh, so very cool feature. Um, I, yeah, I think that's a differentiator. I think Wallaby.js actually does something similar. Um, I remember seeing in the issues uh, when you were working on this, he was like, this is not a, an easy problem to solve. So it's amazing that you were able to, to do that. Kudos to you. Right. I mean, I think we have a little bit of an easier time um, because I think Wallaby does it in the 
um, you know, uses uh, is is browser based too. If I'm not correct, if I'm not mistaken, and I think that's uh, makes it a little bit harder. With uh, Node, you can hook right into require statements. Makes it a little bit easier. I mean, it still was pretty marked in some pretty amazing work. Cool. So what else uh, about Ava? I, I think there are probably a couple more features about Ava that um, um, you wanted to call out. Um, yeah, I, kind of a consequence of splitting up into multiple test files and running each of them in their own process is uh, isolation. So um, if you have a um, poorly designed API that has, uses some global state that can mess things up between test runs or, rely, or, or poorly designed tests that rely on glo global state between test runs, um, you're going to, that's suddenly going to come apparent with Ava because A, your test order execution is not guaranteed due to its async nature and each test file is running concurrently, again, um, based on contention, tests may not all run at the same time. So if you don't design a good API and a good test suite that doesn't maintain global state and, and you know isn't running a clean test each time, you're go that's going to surface a lot sooner than it would with any other test runner. And so you almost are getting like, um, like for example, if you were running tests against a, a, a mock server, right? Like if you were going to spin up a server and write some tests against it, all your tests are going to be hitting that server at the same time, and so um, if you don't create like you you can't rely on global state, and it's also going to be getting hit from multiple angles at the same time from your tests, and so it has it's going to surface the sort of thing that would normally be hidden in your test code when you're running a set of serial one at a time tests, and then go to deploy into production. And it's getting hit obviously by multiple users at once. Uh, I I actually found that out the hard way when trying to uh, do some stuff with console.log. Um, and at first it seems like well this is dumb like I <laughs> you know this is annoying, but after like playing around with it for a little bit it's it's the same kind of thing of tying your hands to free your mind. It makes it a lot easier to think about your tests and you, and you just. Um, when when your tests are limited in this fashion, it actually makes your applicate like you ha you're kind of forced to write your applications a little bit better as well. Um, so I I would agree that's also a, a good feature of of the framework. The other thing that's nice about the isolation is you can sort of mess with the process. You can start spying on Node's default libraries uh, because when it's all, when all your tests are done, that process just goes away. So you haven't interfered with any other tests. Oh, that's that's interesting. I hadn't actually thought about that. So, like, you can spy on it, and then you just you don't have to clean up after yourself. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Very cool. I hadn't thought about that. I'm gonna have to make some updates. <laughs> and actually, one feature that we're kind of discuss discussing and we've kind of backburnered for a while is actually taking it further, optionally and forking for every individual test, even within a test file. And one advantage to that would be um, with polyfills. So if you were going to install a polyfill and, and, and run some assertions before the installation and then after the installation, right, your polyfill by its own, by its very nature is going to modify the global state, right? And so then you've got to write code to undo that, which isn't really that clean of a test because then you're manually... Uh, you, you, there's potential for error there introduced. Whereas if you're writing, if you're getting a new clean fork each time, it's pristine environment guaranteed. Obviously, that would slow some things down because there's overhead to forking that many processes. So that would never be our default option, but it's something we've discussed for that specific type of purpose. Like I am, I have a test, a series of tests that I know I want to have mess with global state. So give me a clean state for every single one of these tests. And you could accomplish that right now by splitting into a one file per test if you wanted to, but that's not a super convenient way to do things. Um, so that's under discussion. It's it's pretty low priority right now, but a cool idea for the future. Cool. Yeah, so um, while we're talking about priorities and things, I, I think that one 
Uh, one thing that lots of people are kind of waiting for or, or would be interested to hear about is browser support. Uh, so you mentioned earlier that um, Ava doesn't currently support the browser. Um, is there any word on that um, ever becoming a feature? Is that a priority at all for Ava to eventually support running in the browser? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> browser support is definitely on the roadmap because we really do understand that it should it should be present uh, in the first stable release in the zero in the 1.0 release, and um, there is some work before that happens. First, we need to abstract the way we spawn new tests because we currently rely, uh, as James said, on forking on creating new processes. So that has to be abstracted away so that we can easily replace replace it with something else on browser, and. Basically, there is a lot of also refactoring work, work involved in that uh, transition, that uh, browser support before that happens. But it's definitely coming soon. Yeah, and like, I mean, a couple things. First, I think we're actually going to be in pretty good shape um, because we are already forking. Um, the actual, the ability for a parent process and a child process to communicate, uh, that API, um, the the... I can't remember. It's uh, CPI cross process. I can't remember what it's called. Um, uh, IPC. IPC interprocess. Yeah. Correct. Thank you, Mark. Um, uh, that API looks remarkably similar to Socket.io, right? So I think we're going to actually have we're not going to have to refactor messaging as much as we might have otherwise if we had a different structure. Um, so I, th you know, but but really our in our discussions we were like, yes, browser support would be really nice. But at the same time, that's going to add just a whole ton of overhead to the team because as soon as you introduce browsers, right, you introduce a whole ton of problems, right? Because there's a million different flavors and you got to support them all and, you know, you're, you're hunting down issues on boxes that run on a different operating system and then, you, then you've gotten, like, it just... You know, everybody who does front-end development knows how painful it is to support the myriad of browsers out there and the different types of issues that can arise. And so that's why we backburnered it, because we wanted to focus on getting the test runner right first. And now as we're kind of getting pretty close to being feature complete, you know, we've, we've had discussions that it's we're pretty close to getting ready to focus on browsers. Cool. I, I actually think that's a, a pretty good segue into the next thing I wanted to talk about, and that is um, growing a project like Ava. So um, I think that you all have made a, a pretty good call um, to say, like, that's definitely something that we're going to do, but we're not going to work on it now because that would just um, slow down development on everything else. Let's let's get everything else done first, and then we can deal with the browser stuff. Because... Um, now, like, anybody who is able to work around having it run in the browser, you know, like me, I I, I have a React application, and we just use JS DOM, and it works fine um, for us. But, uh, yeah, so I can enjoy Ava while it gets all feature complete, and then you can work on browser, and then I can enjoy that new feature. Um, so what, what are some of the things, uh, other things that you've done to um, help um, the Ava project grow and mature? Um, to where it is now? Interesting question. Um, I mean, really, Sindre would be yeah. the, the best guy to answer this. Unfortunately, he's not on the call. Sindre's got a pretty far reach in terms of you know the people who follow him and contribute to his stuff. But I think he's also got a pretty unique gift in his ability to like you know empower a community to contribute to stuff because we've just seen an explosion of projects around Ava that Sindri has kind of kick-started by opening up the repo and then just empowering people to take over and run with run with the project like um, you know our, our linter um, is, I think Jeff Mengels his name is basically running that he's basically running that um, we've got Sublime plugins that people are running, plugins for Atom. You know, these are projects that I've, many of them I've never even opened up and looked at the source code, and yet there's people contributing, and he's kind of just by 
being sort of open-handed with, um, you know, his baby here. He's really grown our team pretty large pretty quick, and we're getting a lot done really fast, and it's pretty cool to see the excitement. We've got, uh, how many languages are we translated into now? I believe four or five. Yeah, understand. and, and uh, Forrest, uh, he's a French, he's running the whole show for us, right? Really, he's doing an amazing job of reviewing, um, even in languages he doesn't speak, he goes through and he checks the link on every single translated document, and if, you know, they link to, they may keep the link to an English-speaking Wikipedia page, he says, shouldn't this be in German or Chinese or, you know, li link to the German version, you know, like he just does an amazing job of uh, maintaining that, and there's a whole bunch of people who are contributing to AVA that aren't part of the AVA core team, but are doing amazing things to forward it make it better. So thank you to everybody who's doing that. Yeah, definitely. Huge thanks. So I think that the takeaway for, for anybody who's listening or watching that would be like wanting to encourage people to contribute to their project, what, what would you say are some of the like pro tips or, or takeaways uh, from the uh, AVA project that uh, people could implement in their own projects to encourage contribution? Well, I... I remember one good thing that Sindra uh, recommended or advised uh, to me. It was like that's that's actually how the, he grown the team to like four of us. And the advice was don't be scared of letting people contribute and give and give them like direct access to the repository to the like everything because that's something I thought should uh, should not be possible like. Uh, before, and I just see like, um, like in the case with me, I contributed at the beginning like three or four pull requests, and he like uh, just pinged me, hey, do you want to be uh, like in the team? Do you want to be more involved? Like, and I was, and I was like excited, and he, hell yeah, and that's how it happened, how it happened with each of us. So I guess that's one one tip to give people freedom to ask them actually to contribute. Don't be afraid to ask people. To contribute, hey, like, do you want to pull request? Do you want, do you want to do a pull request for your uh, like suggestion? So that's that's uh, something. Yeah, I think it's kind of like human nature. Like, this is you know we're all invested in Ava, and there's this kind of like I don't want to give up control. I don't want to, um, but I you know Sindre has a pretty amazing attitude of like I'm going to release that to people and just trust them to do a good job. And when he does that, right. Um, when you do that with somebody, you're, it, somebody wrote a blog post, I'll, I'll hunt it down and put it in the links, and he, his basic response was, if I get one or two good contributions from a person, I make them a contributor on my repo. And he talked about how his pro, you know, he now has people writing for uh, repositories that he owns and gets credit for every day that uh, he's doing little of the work on. Uh, I'll hunt that down, put it in a link. It was a pretty interesting read. Um, it was a long time ago, so hopefully I can find it. But um, you know, and I think too, it's um, one of the key things he said is that when I came on the team, he said I think what he said is the only rule is be nice to everybody, meaning like be respectful to somebody who comes in with an idea that you think is bad or a PR that you think is not of the greatest quality or, you know, kind of shepherd them through um, getting that PR to an acceptable state and just instead of just hitting reject, you know, because that builds excitement around the team. And we had a guy who came to, you know, started contributing back, I think, in November, December, right around the same time I joined the team. And it was right, you know, one of the first PRs I responded to after having that conversation kind of came in and it was... I think I had like, you know, I had to do like 12 different iterations or 12 different pretty lengthy comments on how, you know, what he should fix and how he should change it and, and get him to the point where it kind of fit of his style and where we were going. And, you know, and then the next PR, he said to me something, you know, we had to be rebased. And he said, oh, what's rebase? 
and then um, you know, and and then the next question was, I can do a PR from a different branch than master, right? You know, and so to me, right at that point, I was like getting a little frustrated, like, okay, this is taking forever. And well, fast forward to now, this guy's our fifth or sixth highest contributor. Um, is now producing quality work for us weekly without, you know, much direction at all, um, is evangelizes on every Hacker News feed and, um, you know, and is excited about Ava and telling everybody about it, is contributing to some of these other side projects. And you look, and from December, like I just yesterday went and looked at his GitHub profile. And before December, he had... A, a contribution once a month, once every two weeks. He's on an 80-day run of open source contributions. So yeah. he just jumps on whatever issue coming up. Yeah. Where like we, we all we, know, we, uh, we all know yeah. who we're talking about. We all know who will pick it up. Yeah. We just find a good for beginner or like a help wanted label, and we know that like one day later or maybe less, there is a pull request for it, and just yeah. just awesome. Yep. And I think you know, for me, and, and you know, what um, for me, what that really taught me was like, you know, first of all, right, I, I jumped to an early conclusion that he didn't know what he was doing. I was totally wrong, right? He didn't know GitHub, and he didn't un understand open source, but he's a great developer, right? And so, um, I think that's a big lesson to take away, right? Is in in uh, as all software engineers have a tendency to do that, right? Like you deal with people, a lot of people all day long, you know, on the business side, or you know, if you do tech support or whatever, you deal with people who don't understand what you're talking about. But there are plenty of people who do, and uh, you shouldn't make that assumption early. You should give people a chance. I think that's been really, really cool part of the team. I mean, that's pretty amazing to me even, right? Like, I mean, look at my history. Like I said, I run a construction company and do this on the side, right? And Sindre gave me a chance and didn't, and he asked me what I did for a living like four days after I joined the team. You know, that's kind of the magic of GitHub too, is that you can just uh, be accepted based on your skills and, and not necessarily on who you are or what your background is, you know? So that's been really, that's been really cool to watch. Very cool. Um, so, I actually just to comment on some of the um, the things that you you said, which I think was super awesome. So, um, I I think that um, like that that story is a really good example of um, the value of being beginner friendly um, and having having a repository that that is welcome and open to contributors who are new to contributing. Um, uh, so like this is a self plug here, but um, I this is something that I really deeply care about. Um, and so there's a a series on Egghead IO called How to Contribute to an Open Source Project on GitHub uh, that I I like to reference people to, and it, it talks about stuff like rebase, and it talks about um, you know uh, changing uh, commit messages and and different things like that, like all the stuff that. You know, and, and it starts really basic, like this is how you create a GitHub account, and this is how you, you know, file an issue and whatever. Um, so I think that by creating more resources like that and um, pointing people to those, you know, free and useful resources um, that we can be, uh, make our projects more inviting to beginners um, and just make the whole experience better. And then to also talk, uh, touch on what you talked about with Sindre being really open to giving commit access. Uh, Michael Richards recently uh, did a blog or posted a blog post um, called "Healthy Open Source," um, and he's on the Node.js um, uh, foundation. Um, and this blog post was basically how the Node project manages um, their you know committer pipeline. Um, it, it's an amazing blog post, and I'll, I'll link to it. Uh, but basically, they they do very much the same thing. Anybody who lands a non-trivial uh, commit into the project gets commit access to Node. Like that's you know this is not a small project, and it's been incredibly value, like helpful to them. And I've started doing this, and and I've noticed the exact same thing. So anybody watching who's 
got a you know open source projects that you're looking for more contributors to, um, be a little bit more open um, and and helpful to people. And ultimately, like like you said, um, be nice, and uh, you'll get more contributors. So I think that's probably all the time that we have to talk about that because uh, time is going quickly. Um, so we did actually get a, a question on Twitter that I think is applicable uh, to kind of where I want to take the discussion next, and that's from Alex Booker. What is something Ava doesn't do well? So bringing the conversation back to actually the Ava testing framework, uh, what are some things, some areas where Ava is not very awesome and areas where uh, it could be improved? Um, I mean, there's a... Uh there's a myriad of them, right? I mean, obviously, we've discussed browser support, um, and uh, but we've just kind of recently run into an issue with, especially I think the React community, where they like to generate lots and lots of separate um, test files, um, and we've got people with 30, 40 different test files, and I think most of us write modules that, you know, small modules that might have half a dozen or a dozen, and um, um, they're running into issues on Travis because we're forking all these processes without any kind of throttling or restriction on concurrency, and uh, it's blowing up on them. So pretty pretty major problem for them. Um, and so you know there's there's still some rough edges to be you know figured out um, because we don't transpile everything. You still need to load Babel uh, in a lot in every thread if you're transpiling your sources. Um, and Babel is, takes a long time to load. Um, it wasn't really designed to be, you know, th this wasn't in mind when they designed it, forking a, a dozen different short-lived processes that you're killing off and relaunching over and over again. Um, so for our tests, we actually don't load Babel to transpile the test in that test process. We do it in the main process, save that off the disk, and then the sub-process loads that up off the disk. So the next step is, is via static analysis and some other tricks, um, um, do that for everything that you might want transpiled uh, in the main, you know, transpile the main thread and allow, uh, prevent Babel from having to be loaded in all those threads so it's faster. So it's fast in certain situations now, you can make it slower than some of the alternatives if you've got the wrong setup. Well, I think that uh, um, the problems that you're seeing are, are people are starting to use this in applications, not just smaller modules. Um, and so, like in giant, you know, big applications, uh, you you do wind up with a lot of test files. I I think right now my project has like probably 15 test files, but I'm sure that we're like we, we have really bad coverage right now, and we're working on improving it. By the end of it, I'm sure we'll have 100 test files or something like that. So um, I hope that all of those things are resolved before we get there. <laughs> um, yeah. So a anything else that uh, really needs to be worked on? A Alex Booker actually asked another question that is relevant to this as well, and uh, his question is, what innovative features can we look forward to in the future? So that, I think, is kind of tied to this question as well. Um, any answers there? Oh, we've, we've dumped so many ideas and so many stuff and features already that it's hard, like, to surprise people one more time, <laughs> like, with all of that, what we have uh, currently built in. Um, well, the brow uh, innovative browser support, I wouldn't call that, but, well, what James said about transpiling uh, both the sources and tests, I think that's that would be a major win for users, developers, because it's, it, currently we have a lot of frustration with that. Um, and, ba and yeah, basically improvements in the watcher area. Uh, I think uh, watcher haven't, hasn't been as advertised as, uh, like, as all of the other features, but it definitely deserves a lot of attention with all of its intelligent features and track independencies. So, yeah. <laughs> Maybe James or Mark can add some. I think we're pretty good at keeping an eye out on, on things that can make developer experience better. Um, James just suggested the other day having a 
a failure test, like a test that you know is going to fail. So then if somebody has a bug report, they can, even if they don't know how to fix the issue, they can contribute a failing test, which you can merge without it breaking your CI. Um, it's, it's, it's those kinds of features um, that we'll always keep an eye out for and, and want to add because it makes Ava you know, more fun to use and more, just more useful. Yeah, that's cool. what I was going to bring up, the, the, the failing test. And, and it, you know, um, still show in red, still print it out, but don't, don't, uh, don't cause a zero, uh, non-zero exit code so that your tests still pass, but you, you have the print out there that there's still something wrong, that bug is still logged. Um, and then Mark even suggested, like, what if we added an optional ability to reference the GitHub issue link, you know. I think that's a pretty cool idea, too. And then if it once you pass it, it actually will fail, and you have to convert it to a, you know mark it as a non-failing test and say now it's part of the the test suite. You know the bug is fixed. Yeah, we've Very got cool. a lot of these nice small things in store and in future. Great. I think I think some speed improvements. I think we've got some ideas on those. Like right now in watch mode, we wait till we see a. Um, change and then we fire up all these child processes and start sending them tests. I think it'd be cool to warm up those processes ahead of time, knowing that, hey, we're going to get some tests eventually um, and, you know, load up whatever dependencies we know we can load ahead of time and then when it comes time to run the tests, that, that pro you know, you know Shaving just a few hundred more, a few hundred more milliseconds off uh, response time when you're doing TDD. Yeah, definitely TDD, and like that's kind of the use case for for watch mode, right? Um, and so, I, I have noticed that like once I save a file, it it does take just a second, you know, for something to actually happen. Looking forward to that speed up. I I notice like mostly for me when I'm using Ava. Um, actually running the test is is crazy fast. Like when I'm looking at the output, it's like holy cow, this is going like lightning fast. But um, getting started is is the slow piece, and I think that's that translation um, stuff first, and and warming up those child processes. So looking forward to improvements there. Um, so I think we're we're coming down on our time, um, and there are a couple of things that I wanted to make sure that we cover before um, we wrap up. So um, as this is, um, you know, Sindre's brainchild, um, another thing that Sindre is really known for is having uh, really small modules. And just yesterday, we had this huge debacle over a, a module that's 11 lines long. It pads uh, a string with zeros or, or pads a string to, on the left. It's called pad left. And it was unpublished and broke the internet, um, sort of. <laughs> Um, and so people are just thinking like, you know, like it's confirming lots of people's fears about small modules and saying like, you see, this is why we shouldn't do small modules. So um, I, I think that it'd be great. I, I wish that Sindre um, had come on, but um, maybe you all can talk a little bit because Ava is really constructed of a lot of small modules. So maybe um, if you all have an opinion on this, I, I think it'd be great to hear what you have to say. Yeah, I think reusable modules is a really cool idea. And um, as for that module, that unpublished module, I don't think that it's a great, uh, it's a it's a good sense to actually judge the whole technique by one failed case. It's like saying that you shouldn't drive a car because you might get a puncture one day. It's like me, nobody's protected from that. So it, you shouldn't avoid uh, using small reusable modules because someone unpublished something. And it's definitely a good feeling to uh, know that, okay, I'm building this app, I need this, 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 and this. And just, like, it's like Lego blocks. Just put one of the other and you got a great, good picture in the end. So another great, another great uh, advantage of small modules is that they all independently testable. They all have greater coverage as a consequence from, from that. That they are individual, they're not dependent on something else. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of good opinions, both both good and bad, but generally good. 
And uh, I think we uh, in Ava project uh, seen that this is actually a good thing. Right. There's a blog post by um, Sindri on his GitHub AMA um, about small modules. He gives a great answer. Somebody asked him about it. Um, he used that Lego block reference that Vadim said. And I think I think the debacle yesterday is kind of the exact opposite of what you know some of the, the way some people are spinning it. Right. We had an eleven line module disappear from NPM um, and it broke yeah it broke a lot of things um, but it was a matter of hours till it was fixed because A it was an open source module um, so if somebody was able to just republish it um, no problem and again the, what failed what disappeared was 11 lines of code um, if you relied only on large modules and that happened to you, right? Suddenly you've put all your eggs in one basket, um, and uh, you could be in—you'd be hurting a lot more than having to rewrite yourself the ability to pad a, 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 a string on the left side. You know, like, yeah, anybody can do it really quickly, but that's the advantage of small modules is that somebody's already done it, and you don't have to think through all the little corner cases. Um, I think the benefits far outweigh the risks, and uh, the notion that yesterday was a big debacle is kind of funny to me, um, because it seemed like it was, it was resolved before I even knew about it. I found about it out about it all after the fact, like it didn't affect my life at all. You know, I think it failed one out of a build, and you know, we've got uh, you know way more issues with just app there being flaky than than. Uh, NPM failing us and small module design failing us. You know. It's it's surprisingly hard to write code. Um, so if you can pull in a module that somebody else wrote, or maybe a lot of people have used and looked at and improved, that's always preferable over writing some utility yourself, trying to test it. Um, that will distract from your pull request from the feature you're trying to introduce. It, it's more overhead for somebody to understand, whereas normally you see an error union dependency, like you have an idea what it means, you can quick look at the docs, like, okay, cool, That's this is I know what it does, I don't have to worry about it. Yeah, and I think um, when you um, allow yourself to put this stuff that could be a separate module in your core code base and live there with your project, you are just really tempting yourself to break encapsulation, right? Like, it's almost guaranteed to happen over time that your array union code is going to have, you're going to say, you know what, in this case, I need it to do this one unique thing for Ava. Hey, I'm going to slip that in there, right? And now suddenly it's something else entirely from what you originally designed for, and you're just asking for trouble by doing that. You know, keeping good encapsulation, Forcing yourself to write documentation for you know that's going to be published on npm for your little tiny module uh, makes you design a better API. You know makes you think about how that little chunk of code should work a little bit better. And it I would say the the most important things like if somebody was really interested in that read read Andre uh, read Sindre's, uh, uh response. I'll, I'll put in the links. And uh, also set yourself up with tooling that allows you to make small modules fast, quickly. And by that I mean Yeoman. Um, use a generator. Um, Sindre's got one called uh, Generator NM um, that is basically like really bare bones. And that's kind of the idea with a small module. Don't have a lot of dependencies. I think they're, the dependencies are XO and AVA, which is a linter in the testing framework. Um, and uh, just get going, but you know you want some, you want to automate that task, um, and so you want to be able to quickly when you when you recognize a bit of code that could be pulled out and put in its own module, be able to make that happen in a matter of five to fifteen minutes, as opposed to you know spending hours hours doing that, and it takes some practice, right? Like uh, learning that tooling, and, and but if you do it, you're going to be way better off. Cool. I, I, so I think we are really coming close on time. Um, and I, there are more things to talk about, about Ava specifically, that I, I think that we didn't really touch on. 
Um, and so if there is anything else that uh, you all wanted to make sure we, we bring up now is the time. Is there anything else that um, you think we should really cover about Ava? Well, just a big thumbs up to all the contributors. It just it feels amazing participating in the Ava project every day and waking up to 100 notifications each day. So, so yeah, it's it probably wouldn't happen uh, without all of these super cool guys. Indeed, indeed. Big big thank you to everybody who's helping. And even and even you know, come file issues in the repo. That's a big help to us too to to figure out what's wrong. Yeah. So one thing that I um, since we do have a second, I think it would be valuable to talk about the um, the API um, to Ava a little bit um, and design decisions specifically the um, Ava mantra. Um, maybe um, somebody can talk about the the mantra of Ava. I, don't, I think it's kind of like a, a little sub mantra we have. I don't know that it's you know it, it drives a lot of our design design decisions, but that's it. I think it's stolen from Python. Um, there should be one only one way to do things, um, if at all possible. You know, and so you see that in a lot of our decisions. Like uh, you, can, you even uh, brought one up about um, renaming a couple of the assertion methods and you know aliasing for, instead of renaming, and that's kind of like against our mantra, right? There should be one way to do a truthy assertion, and right now that's okay and versus truthy, the name of the method, and we're not going to alias it, but, you know, um, rather, we'd rather deprecate and rename. And the reasons, you know, the main reason behind that, really, is that when you have a long list of aliases or you have ten different ways to attack the problem that, that have no functional alternate benefit, right? Like, uh, it's fine if you need to have multiple ways to do things to accomplish what you need to do, but if there is a way that works and it's not overly painful, then um, there's no reason to alias a method just because that's somebody's preference. Um, because what it does is it creates a. If you go into an Ava project r right now, you auto and you and you know Ava, you know everybody's assertion methods, right? It's it's not just that. Um, like I, I talked about the issue, like that tap has a lot of aliases, like six or seven for every method, it seems like. Um, and it's happened to me before where somebody else uses a different method name than the one I'm used to, and tap also has the ability to add custom assertions. And I'm like, I think that might be just an alias for a built-in assertion, or maybe that's a custom assertion. I don't know. I gotta go check the docs. Right, or I gotta hunt through their code base. Um, and um, if you maintain a mi minimal API, yes, people may not love the the names you chose, but um, having mo more than one way to do it just creates overhead, right? It just creates in in the developer's mind, in the user's mind, there's one more thing they've got to learn. And yes, we definitely could Im maybe improve. Um, uh, what some things are named, so they're a little bit more intuitive, but um, and we're debating that in an issue right now. But uh, I think it's way better to keep it focused, right? Like keep it easy to to wrap your head around. It's complicated enough as it is. Yeah, basically we just have to say no sometimes, but in a nice way. So, <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, uh, you said no to my PR in a nice way, and <laughs> so that was good. Um, and, and I'm cool with that. So, okay, um, I think we're going to move into our tips and picks. Um, we answered all the questions on, on Twitter, so we can skip right into tips and picks. Um, I'll go ahead and go first, and then I'll let each of you go. So first, my tip is um, related to this um, you know, NPM unpublished debacle of yesterday. Um, my tip is to bundle your dependencies. And so if you're using 11 lines of code, it's probably OK to just include that 11 lines of code in your project um, as like a bundled dependency. And so this is a feature that's supported by NPM. You just, um, in your package.json, provide an array of dependencies you want bundled into your project. And those will be installed or, or um, part of what you publish. And so you'll still have a node modules directory. Um, and when you publish, it will publish your node modules directory with those 
installed dependencies, which is actually kind of kind of fancy and cool. Uh, there are some obviously some downsides to that as far as like getting you know patch updates to those dependencies and things like that. Um, but for 11 lines of code, um, it's probably okay to do that. Um, and so I actually created a screencast to demonstrate. Well, I, I created the screencast while I was trying out the feature to see if it would actually work, and it did. And so I I published the screencast uh, to YouTube. So I've got a link to that. Um, and then for my picks, um, I have Ghooks plus Opt CLI. So Ghooks is a, a module that I actually help maintain that installs uh, Git hooks when it's installed, so that when uh, like um, you know, you're working on a project with a team of people. You want to share Git hooks, like pre-commit hooks or pre-push hooks or whatever. It will um, um, allow you to configure what should run when somebody pushes code or something like that. So you can run linting and stuff. Um, however, this adds a barrier to open source projects. So if you want to make it easy for people to contribute to your project, it's not very friendly to um, you know, to people who are just getting started to not even be able to commit any code because you've got a linter and they, they don't understand this thing. So um, some somebody created opt CLI that allows you to um, opt in or opt out of certain scripts. And so you just say opt in this thing and then execute this script. And so you have these uh, git ignored um, um, or the, yeah, these git ignored files that uh, say which things you're opting in and out of and then um, you can opt into these git hooks. So anyway, um, I, I actually have a pull request on Lodash right now to add this, and I think it's probably been merged by now. Um, so yeah, cool stuff. Finally, um, Hubot is um, a GitHub bot creating library or thing uh, written in, in CoffeeScript, uh, so you can use it in your Node projects. But uh, basically allows you to have a like I'm pretty sure most of the Git bot, uh, GitHub bots out there use Hubot to automate stuff on pull requests, make sure CLI, CLA, CLAs are signed, or or make sure that linting is passing or whatever. So check out Hubot. So those are my tips and picks. Why don't we go with James next? Okay, so uh, my first pick would be to spend some time learning about small modules. Um, I go re like um, I go read Sindre's AMA. Uh, link there. I'll provide a link there, and then um, I check out Generator NM um, uh, or some other Yeoman generator um, to automate uh, your creation of your modules. Like managing package.json is not what we all are interested in doing, right? Like, so use something else to do it for you. Um, uh, so for my picks. Um, the first few are a little self-serving. XO is another project that we work on. It's a, a zero config linter. Again, it, it kind of falls in that same mantra of there should only be one way to do things. Um, um, the, it's a linter that comes with a series of defaults, kind of like if you're familiar with JavaScript, JavaScript standard. Um, it's got some extra features beyond that. Go check that out. Um, the TrueSize.com is a project that I was lucky enough to work on with a buddy. It's, if you like maps, check it out. Even if you don't, it's kind of mind blowing. Um, um, got a lot of uh, you get a lot of feedback from uh, geography students that they uh, think it's really cool. Geography teachers, rather. And then um, uh, essay I love by uh, Bob Sutton, Strong Opinions Weekly Held. Um, I think it's a great short. Like a couple paragraph reads, um, but I think it's a great uh, thing to keep in mind. Cool, thanks, uh, Vadim. Why don't we have you go next? Yeah, so I have a one short tip. Uh, basically, not not even uh, JavaScript specific tip, just a general tip, in, uh, uh, which is don't overcomplicate and always look for a simple solution. Solution instead. Uh, so it basically means just get off the ground quickly, deliver, ship and uh, you will always find time to make it big, hard, complex, whatever. So uh, just get started and uh, iterate. And as for my picks, I picked um, an article uh, by Jason Fried, which is called Give It Five Minutes, which is basically what we talked uh, about today, about, about patience, about giving people a chance and like evaluating their ideas before rejecting them impulsively. 
So I think that's a very helpful article for both open source projects and uh, well, just generally in life. So yeah, that's my pick. Cool, thanks. Mark? Um, on, on the subject of, of small modules, um, one thing you can do when you, when you publish your small module is uh, if you use the files option in the package JSON, you can list just the files that you need to publish. So that way you can avoid publishing your tests and images and other kinds of assets you might have for your uh, repo. Um, so then they're actually smaller packages. Um, you can use npm pack, which generates a tarball on your own machine. And then through whatever the tar command is, you can list all the files just to make sure that you have included everything you needed to, to include. Um, so that's my tip. My, my pick is that next month, Node 6 is going to come out, which has a lot more awesome JavaScript features. Um, and if you go to node.green, that shows you the compatibility table um, with Node 6 in there, and it's like almost all green. So that's going to be pretty sweet. Wow, I'm looking at it right now, and it looks legit. Cool, looking forward to that. Um, all right, so with that, I'll just go ahead and give our closing announcements really quick. So uh, first, a shout out to our silver sponsors, O'Reilly Fluent Conf, Auth0, and Trading Technologies. Thank um, them if you get the chance um, for their awesome stuff that they provide to us. Um, and then check out uh, suggest.javascriptair.com if you have suggestions for the show, guests, and, and topics. Um, and then go to feedback.javascriptair.com to submit feedback about this show or any show or the entire show in general. Uh, really appreciate your feedback. And then uh, remember that uh, um, our show is weekly, and so we have another show next week um, on Vue.js or Vue.js uh, with Evan Yu. Probably better figure out how to pronounce that before the show. Um, and then, as always, follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Google Plus to keep up with the latest and greatest from JavaScript Air. So with that, um, I'll just say thank you to our guests. Thank you. Thanks. And Thanks for having us. We'll see you all next week. Bye. Bye. See you. Bye. I'll go post.